All right, so today we're going to be talking about the rise of modern China, basically, from its revolutionary time uh, from the early 20th century uh, through its revolution and its big economic changes that have today made it into one of the giant world economies and one of the most powerful countries in the world, which is a big, big step because when we start this lecture, I mean, the last time we talked about China, um, they were still basically a European colony struggling to break free from the late 1800s, early 1900s, and were starting revolutionary movements. Um, so China was at that time still largely a kind of 1800s type economy, very agrarian, focused on farming, was uh, the overwhelming majority of their economy. Not much industrialization, but they did have a very, very large population already at that point, one of the largest populations in the world. Uh, so again, today we're going to go through uh, how they finally do uh, break free from European colonialism and establish themselves as an independent country again, and uh, the political decisions they begin to make to try to build up their economy. So starting off with the revolution. All right. Uh, first section is on the revolution and uh, the rise of the new leadership. So uh, several revolutionary movements had happened against European colonial powers in the early 1900s that we've already gone over. Uh, the really big revolt against the emperor himself broke out in 1926, which dethroned the emperor, which forced him basically into retirement. And then uh, several factions started fighting each other in China for control to see what kind of government the new Chinese government would be and what their focus would be and what they want the country to become. So the Chinese revolution turned into a multifaceted civil war among many different contenders, many different factions, and it really went on and on into the 1930s until Japan invaded parts of China, which started World War II in East Asia. Um, this happened in the early 1930s several years before World War II started in Europe with uh, the German invasions. So the Chinese Revolution, the factions were fighting each other for several years and when they get invaded from an outside force they unify to try to kick out that foreign invader and occupier and uh, try to basically bring China back under Chinese control and that takes quite a while because World War II will go through 1945 so the Chinese experience with World War II is well over a decade. And uh, once uh, the United States largely defeated Japan by the end of 1945, then the Chinese factions start fighting each other again. Uh, so that unity dissolved the next year in 1946. And again, it breaks out into a multifaceted, uh, multi-faction civil war. And that civil war went on for about three years. Uh, one of the big, biggest factions in the Civil War were the Chinese Communist Party, and they are the eventual winners over uh, the several different other groups. The kind of biggest uh, group that fought against the Communists were known as the Nationalists. Uh, they were Western-backed, especially supported by the United States uh, during this early Cold War period because the U.S. government is looking to fund uh, really almost any group that is willing to fight off communism and try to keep communism out of power in virtually any major country. So the United States have been supporting the nationalists after World War II and uh, when the U.S. government stopped supporting the nationalists, uh, because the nationalists were also themselves uh, fairly corrupt, um, when the U.S. government stopped supporting the nationalists in about 1945, uh, that's when the nationalists basically collapse and the uh, communists win the civil war in China. So the nationalists uh, flee the mainland China and they go off to this uh, smaller island to the southeast of the mainland called Taiwan and they establish Taiwan as what they call an independent country, um, which mostly still stands today as it, it calls itself an independent country, an independent republic. Um, but generally, uh, most countries recognize Taiwan as kind of theoretically part of China today. Uh, but the Chinese communists took over mainland China, and uh, they will build a new government and run China for many, many years. Uh, Mao Zedong is the leader of the Chinese Communist Party, so he becomes the Stalin-type figure in China. He will build a dictatorship. 
and he will run a lot of very similar uh, economic programs that uh, Stalin attempted in the Soviet Union uh, in the 1920s and 30s. Um, the big lesson for the U.S. government, though, from this kind of collapse of the, the anti-communist faction is that uh, the U.S. just assumes that any communist revolution that succeeds or even is attempted in almost any country in the world is controlled and directed from Moscow by the Soviet Union. And Mao, as the leading communist party in China and the leading communist group, uh, immediately started looking for friendly relations with the Soviet Union and other communist countries. Uh, so the Chinese communist victory in the Civil War in August 1945, and then the party's immediate steps in China internationally to you know, form alliances with other communist countries, uh, really supported this growing theory in the United States that any communist movement must be um, kind of controlled by Moscow and looking to win the worldwide communist revolution against capitalism instead of possibly just being an anti-colonial nationalist movement. So uh, that's something important to remember for the Cold War in general and uh, for a lot of different countries going forward. So what does Mao really want to do in China? Uh, his big policies are really driven by his utopian ideology of communism. Mao is, uh, much like Stalin and other communists, uh, believed that Karl Marx's theories were absolutely perfect, that he was absolutely correct in all of his criticisms of capitalism, and was also perfectly correct in what the solutions to capitalism should be, namely communism. Um, and like Stalin and others, uh, believes in this uh, kind of, if you create a communist society, it will become a perfectly equal society for all people, and it'll get rid of the kind of distinctions between rich and poor, the powerful and the powerless, and uh, you'll have a lot of really perfect human freedom going on in this society. So Mao and the Communist Party in China start trying to implement those ideas to create the utopian perfection in China after they won the Civil War. Um, the biggest thing that they realized, though, very quickly is that, very reminiscent also of the Soviet Union, um, China is really a backward economy. Uh, they are an agrarian, farming-based economy, and they want to industrialize as fast as possible. So the feeling is that uh, in China, we need to start building factories uh, as quickly as possible, because if we don't build those factories, we won't have the means of mass producing weapons or other things for society to make the Chinese government capable of defending itself from a possible invasion from outside. So Mao, like Stalin and other communist leaders, are very aware of their um, kind of uh, questionable or uh, unreliable control over the country and their openness to being invaded by foreign forces. So they're very worried about that. Um, they're worried that China is, could be reconquered by European or Western interest and made back into a colony. So they want to start building factories to uh, build up their mass production possibilities in order to defend themselves in case of a foreign attack. And also the general feeling is that if they industrialize, that will bring economic growth and prosperity. So they just looked around the world and saw that the most prosperous, wealthy countries in the world were the ones that had uh, industrialized in the 1800s and by this point up to the mid-1900s. So they want to industrialize to bring themselves into the modern economy, uh, to defend themselves, and to help their own society grow and achieve the heights of any other country in the world. So they want uh, industrialization as best as possible, and Mao, just like Stalin, wants industrialization as fast as possible. Um, they don't want to go through the 100, 150 years of industrial experience. Uh, they instead want to learn the lessons from the European mistakes when they industrialized in the 1800s and kind of figure out how to solve those problems in the, their own Chinese Industrial Revolution. And they're hoping to really get the Industrial Revolution going and finished within about 10 years or so, 5, 10, maybe 15 years, uh, because they say they're you know, going to hire experts from outside and they're going to you know, apply
learn from the mistakes of the past and apply the solutions and get it done. Uh, one of the giant problems, though, for that policy of mass industrialization is that they need a lot of money to do it. Uh, they need a lot of money to hire the outside advisors to come in and build the factories or at least design the factories. Uh, they need the money to hire the workers to build the places. They need the money to get the machines into the factories. They need the money just to get the resources to build the physical plant, the buildings. Um, and bring all the resources, water and electricity and whatnot, uh, to the factory site. So they need money as fast as possible to make the original investment to build the factories to build up their giant industrial uh, revolution in China. Uh, and you have to remember that China at this point is a very, very poor country, largely because it's a backward agrarian farming based economy. So Mao and the uh, Chinese Communist Party, the CCP leadership, hit on really about the same solution to that problem as Stalin had come up with in the 1920s in the Soviet Union, and that's basically the collectivization of agriculture. Um, Mao and the Chinese Communist Party is going to turn all family farms, all privately owned farms throughout the whole country into government-owned farms. So it's basically nationalization of the farming uh, areas of the farming industry and anyone who worked on their own private farm their own kind of family land uh, will now become government employees instead of private landowners and the government will start moving employees farmers around from one region to another wherever they think that the workers are needed more to meet the kind of demands that the land has um, and this is basically nationalization of the farming industry, the government takeover of private farms uh, everywhere. And it's also going to collectivize or nationalize government takeover of what private industry already exists, what mills and maybe small factories they already have in China, and of uh, mostly commerce, a lot of private businesses uh, buying and selling, importing, importing and exporting in China. So uh, Mao announces this policy in 1955, the collectivization drive. And the idea is that if the government's going to own all the businesses and the factories and the giant portion of the economy, the farms, then the government will run those for profit. Uh, they will pay people a decent wage, hopefully. Uh, the workers pay them a decent wage and they will, you know, grow all the food in society in the mass farmland. They'll use the food to feed their population and the extra food that their highly efficient government-run farming system will create, all that extra surplus harvest, they will sell on the international markets to make money. And they believe that they will be able to make enough money, cash from those sales to bring that money into China and use that money to invest in building up the factory system. So the collectivization of farming, agriculture, and these other industries is an attempt to get the cash, the money, to build their industrial revolution so that they can build up their economy and, and strengthen their defenses and whatnot. So they start talking about um, and start going toward uh, that exact movement. So the next step is by 1958, they feel that they have enough money to go forward with what Mao calls the Great Leap Forward, which is really crash industrialization, start building up the factories. So in 1958, they start hiring advisors, they start hiring workers, they bring the resources together, and they're going to start constructing factories as fast as they possibly can. And again, they have about a five to ten year timeline of um, industrializing uh the most important parts of the country and uh, they, they believe that they will accomplish industrialization within about a decade or so. Um, there's a lot of problems with the Great Leap Forward. Uh, basically it doesn't go very well uh, largely because there's a lot of government corruption and bribery and whatnot going on and just embezzlement. Um, so there's a lot of problems with the Great Leap Forward and it just it doesn't work. Uh, they start building some factories. Uh, factories aren't really usually all that great. Um, the resources can be kind of shoddy uh, because of internal embezzlement and, and really thievery by the government bureaucrats uh, and just bad government decisions about where to build factories and what kind of factories to build and all that. 
So there's a lot of mistakes that are made in the Great Leap Forward. So by the early 1960s, uh, it's getting very clear that this is not working. And Mao has gone into retirement by the early 1960s. Uh, he's getting to be an older guy. He said, basically, I helped lead the revolution and won it. So he goes into retirement and passes his uh, leadership position off to kind of the next generation, um, more middle-aged guys to run the country and accomplish the Great Leap Forward. Um, but it's not going well. And by the mid-1960s, it's very obvious that the Great Leap Forward is basically a gigantic failure. Uh, and Mao and the, kind, the Chinese communist leaders, obviously, like most politicians, are not willing to take the blame themselves for their own mistakes and their own kind of corruptions and bad decisions and whatnot. Uh, so they start to blame other people for their own failures, really. And the other people that they tend to blame are what Mao personally calls in kind of private writings and whatnot that become public, um, kind of capitalist spies that are still out there in society. And they are uh, possibly inside the government, too, in high decision-making positions. And that these capitalist spies are sabotaging the Great Leap Forward. And that's the reason it's not working. Um, these kind of closet capitalists that want to see communism fail. So they worm their way into the government um, and they keep their capitalist identity secret. And they get into power, powerful, influential positions in society in order to destroy the Great Leap Forward internally and make sure that it fails so that communism in China fails and that the whole communist idea fails in China and the Chinese people will be open to bringing back capitalism and if capitalism comes back possibly bring back the foreign occupations and the, the colonists that want to control China from the outside. So this is all a giant theory that Mao and some of his uh, friends and other leaders in the government put together to kind of cover up their own uh, failures, their own planning failures. And uh, Mao, like a lot of politicians, it starts to kind of believe his own propaganda and uh, decides to come out of retirement in 1966 to help get rid of all those capitalist spies that he is accused of being everywhere in Chinese society and government. Um, so he decides to come back into government and take up leadership again in uh, 1966. And he says he's going to lead what he calls a cultural revolution to cleanse Chinese society of all the secret Western and capitalist influences in the government and throughout society. So he wa he's going to launch political purges within the government. Um, and anyone who is accused of being a a capitalist or if there's any evidence of someone of believing capitalism is good or thinking is good on any level uh, they'll be arrested possibly tortured and executed or kicked out of the country or maybe just given long jail terms in you know hard labor camps or something so the cultural revolution is a government purge led by Mao against uh, people that he and his kind of lieutenants accuse of being capitalist spies within the system but the Cultural Revolution is not just that. Mao says that the Cultural Revolution has to go beyond just the government itself. That these capitalists are out there in society. They're out there among the population. So this brings a lot of uh, kind of paranoia into the Chinese population that the government might come after them, even though they're not a member of the government. They're just, you know, some common worker out there. So if you have a book written by Adam Smith or some other capitalist, or you've been listening to Western radio broadcast, or if you have some kind of uh, American music in your house as a recording or something, they might come after you just for that because that's all uh, kind of rolled up with capitalism. So uh, the government starts going after people out in general society and accusing them of being closet capitalists, which scares and destroys a lot of people with the same jail sentences and executions and whatnot. And it goes even beyond that. Um, Mao told the younger generation, uh, teenagers and people in their 20s, that they should be very suspicious of middle-aged people that those middle-aged people might be those closet capitalists in even in your own local area that they might be kind of secretly hiding things or uh, keeping their ideas and their beliefs secret from everybody else and Mao told younger people that if you find capitalists in your area um, or if you suspect them just get rid of them 
So during the Cultural Revolution, there become these kind of roving bands of younger people that interrogated and accused and often just straight out killed middle-aged Chinese people just on this accusation of being a capitalist or trying to destroy the Great Leap Forward. So this does massive damage to China. I mean, millions of people are killed in these purges and this kind of social paranoia and these kind of personal vendettas can even get wrapped up in it because when you have this amount of violence in a society, um, there's so much rampant murder going on that a lot of people feel like they can get away with this. So if you have a beef with your neighbor over, you know, you know they, they're not treating you as nicely as you think they should treat you, and this goes back maybe 20 or 30 years, you might just kill them and get away with it because there's so much rampant violence going on um, that there's no law being enforced really much anymore, especially against a kind of violent acts against people. So there's uh, millions and millions of people are killed in this chaos. And of course it tanks the Chinese economy because you can't have a whole lot of buying and selling and exchange uh, that depends on trust um, that you can actually pay people what you owe. Um, you can't have that in this kind of chaos. So the economy completely is destroyed during the Cultural Revolution and uh, mass starvation kills tens of millions more people um, during the Cultural Revolution. Historians don't even have a very accurate estimate of how many people were killed in all of this. But we do estimate that it's probably tens of millions of people. Um, so this is a horrific, uh, catastrophic era of Chinese history that uh, you know the people who lived through it would never forget it. Uh, and it only ends when Mao dies in 1976. I mean, he just he was old and he just died in office. So he never left the government during the Cultural Revolution. And it only ends when he died. And uh, his highest lieutenants, the people who are helping him run this Cultural Revolution, I mean, everyone else in the government is afraid of these high echelon officials. And so um, the kind of mid-level bureaucrats just have them killed. Uh, so the, Mao's high-level advisors uh, right after Mao died, they're basically all executed or jailed to make sure that none of those advisors kind of rise up to be the next Mao and continue the Cultural Revolution and continue wiping people out. So the Cultural Revolution falls apart, um, or it's killed off once Mao dies, and now you have this kind of transition era from 1976 for the next few years about uh, who's going to be able to get a faction together to kind of take over the government and uh, see what kind of government we're going to get uh, for China going into the future. And uh, the next one we get is going to be led by Deng Xiaoping, uh, and he's going to start the next era of Chinese history. Um, just like uh, you know Stalin in the Soviet Union, or in several other uh, kind of communist-based type governments or communist societies, uh, these are dictatorships. And uh, they are run by really the highest echelon elite. And uh, really the, the elite in the government, the highest level, the top you know, several hundred people in the Communist Party, they basically vote amongst themselves to determine who the leadership is, who's going to be the highest, in the highest government positions. And so uh, there's a lot of infighting and uh, kind of coalition building going on amongst those few highest party members. And it takes a couple years for one faction or one group or another to finally cobble together a coalition amongst the leadership uh, to get appointed to the highest offices and to uh, bring together a new government. So you see Deng Xiaoping doesn't really, isn't really able to get that coalition together and get that majority until very late 1978. So from 76 to 78, it's like this transition government. No one really knows exactly who's going to be in charge for the long term. But by the end of 1968, Deng Xiaoping is named the Chinese Communist Party leader. And um, he is announced as the leadership and his kind of lieutenants in their various offices are announced at the 11th Communist Party meeting in China in December 1978. Uh, so what does Deng want to do? What's his vision for the future? Uh, his biggest vision is really just to not continue what Mao was doing. So uh, basically, Deng renounces these mass ideological movements that Mao was involved with. So um, Deng says that the problem we ran into in the Mao era after the Civil War was won from 1949 until 
basically now the past 30 years, is uh, Mao and his government made decisions based on ideology, based on their beliefs about communism. So everything they did was in this kind of faith movement that Karl Marx is perfect, that the communist idea is perfect, and all you have to do is implement the idea and you'll have the perfect result. And uh, Deng says that, you know, that led all, to all kinds of problems. Uh, the, the Great Leap Forward failed, the Cultural Revolution you know, destroyed society, and now we have to build it on something better than just blind faith and ideology and that everything's going to work out all right. So Deng's idea is to get rid of the ideology. Don't make decisions based on your kind of political beliefs, but make decisions based on real-world economic results of those decisions. And if the results aren't there the way you want them to be, then you change your policy, uh, which was something Mao was never kind of willing to do. So Deng says that we're going to have a lot of economic reforms because, again, a uh, similar kind of goal, we want to build up um, the Chinese industrial base. We want to have a Chinese industrial revolution and we want to do it kind of quickly, as quickly and, uh, and effectively as possible. So he's going to launch what he calls the four major modernizations in farming, in industry, the factory system, in science and technology, and in the Chinese military. So those are the four areas he's going to want to target. His method for doing that is um, very much the exact opposite of the Mao era. Uh, Mao created a government that would made all central decisions for the whole country, the whole economy. Deng said that did not work. So he, what he wants to do instead is to have the central national government really only control the national economic trends or policies like um, general tax policies, general import and export policies, uh, general national budget policies, uh, and he wants to leave the, I mean, the smaller scale local decisions to local economic zones he's going to set up. So he has the Chinese map kind of split up into perhaps a hundred different local economic zones. And each of those areas, kind of like a, a state or a county or something like that, each of those areas is going to have their own Chinese Communist Party leaders that are going to make economic decisions just for that little area. And he said the national government will step back for the most part and allow those local leaders to have different policies for their own area so that they can experiment with different ideas to get economic growth and factory construction and whatnot going. And that all the national government will do is sit back and watch these many different experiments and see which ones work and which ones don't, and then possibly start to apply the, the good ideas that worked on a national scale. So this is very, very different um, from what Mao had done, which was total central planning. Um, Deng Xiaoping's idea looks a lot more like uh, Western governments, like the United States or Britain or France or West Germany, where they have a national government that determines the kind of macro level and national market level economic policies, but leaves the local ideas and experiments to local leaders like states or counties or cities. Um, Mao also wants to bring in the idea of allowing some uh, profit motive companies to exist. And this is very different from what Mao believed. Uh, Mao had wanted uh, full-scale communism, which was the government runs and owns all the factories and virtually all the companies. Um, that was kind of Karl Marx's version of communism. Uh, but Deng says it didn't work. So it didn't work to accomplish the Great Leap Forward. It didn't work to get economic growth going. So what they have to do um, now for the future is to allow private companies to exist in China, uh, run by investors basically, looking to make as much money as possible, the profit motive. And if you allow several of those companies to exist, they will compete with each other. 
and they will find the most efficient ways for their companies to exist because the more efficient you are in, in this profit motive system, the more money you're going to make. And uh, the companies that are least efficient and least profitable will eventually go bankrupt or get bought out or something like that by the you know, most efficient, most profitable, wealthiest companies. So he's setting up an income incentive type program uh, to get private companies going so that they will figure out how to build factories and run factories most efficiently. But he also realizes that, um, that China doesn't have the money to really start building those factories or the expertise right off the bat to start building those factories. So another thing he wants to do is to seek what he calls foreign direct investment. And that means companies from Western countries that will invest money in China to build factories in China, but that those factories will largely be owned and operated by Western companies. So he is inviting Western capitalist companies to come into China, build factories, employ Chinese workers, and uh, that will get economic growth going because you'll have more jobs, more people making paychecks, they'll start spending money on goods and, and rent and housing and, and all these things and that'll get economic growth going very quickly in China and the Chinese government and society and workers will learn how to build factories and how to run them for the greatest efficiency possible to make the most money possible and of course the Chinese government is going to tax these companies so their revenues are um, the Chinese government revenue is going to grow based on the taxes of these profitable companies on these profitable companies so Dung presents this foreign direct investment as a win-win-win for basically everybody uh, and how do you convince foreign companies to want to relocate to China you agree to allow those companies to pay Chinese workers a fairly low wage at least much lower than those companies are paying unionized workers in the United States or West Germany or Britain or France or wherever else or Canada um, so the Chinese workers are largely going to be not unionized they're going to have a low hourly wage and that low wage itself is going to convince companies to relocate to come over to China and build there and um, you know this is international economic competition and uh, the Chinese government is going to allow those companies to get away with all kinds of uh, environmental damage that they wouldn't be allowed to get away with because they're so heavily regulated in places like the United States or Canada. So um, Deng is really opening up China by the early 1980s especially to foreign companies coming in and building these factories and paying low wages and making mass profit and so these jobs uh, start to leave Western countries like the United States, Canada, and Western Europe um, and they start to uh, get relocated basically to China and Deng says this is a great thing for China and uh, as we'll see in a second it is massively uh, successful um, Deng also says though that you know the China these Chinese factories uh, we want to build the cheapest quickest factories possible to get this whole system going so he says we're not going to try to build the highest tech factories we possibly can to make the highest tech goods he says we should start on the low end of the spectrum of the manufacturing spectrum and make the kind of cheapest easiest uh, goods to produce in factories um, because that will get us going so he wants to focus Chinese factories on what he calls light manufacturing which is uh, basically plastic goods that can be made very cheaply, very quickly, and in massive quantities. And um, they can be shipped all over the world for big profit. So um, that's what the Chinese companies start, uh, or Chinese factories start producing by the early 1980s are these kind of like plastic things like uh, toys and uh, you know kitchen utensils or any kind of handheld plastic junk that people use, plastic bags even. Um, uh, cases for objects, I mean all kinds of things um, they start kind of getting manufactured in China on a massive level so that by the kind of early and mid 1980s when some of us were little kids 
uh, we would notice, or maybe our parents would notice, than our little toy truck that we're playing with on the kind of family room carpet. Uh, you look on the bottom of it, and it always starts to say made in China. Or the plastic ladle that you use when you're cooking dinner. You look on it, it says made in China. Or any little plastic good or plastic part for a machine, um, you know, plastic ceiling fan or, you know, any little plastic component, you look on it closely, it starts saying made in China all over the place. Because that's where the stuff was produced. And it was produced for so cheap in these Chinese factories um, that uh, basically these companies just pull their boats up to the factories and the warehouses along the Chinese coastline just fill it up with all this cheap plastic junk and they ship it all over the world uh, for sale in uh, wealthier markets and these companies make huge profits and uh, really the big losers of this are the um, the you know factory workers in these areas where the jobs are leaving and the jobs are going to China so there's a lot of political controversy in the 1970s or 80s and 90s and uh, up through today even about uh, what we call offshoring of jobs, taking factory jobs or production jobs or whatever kind of jobs and moving them to another country where the, the labor costs or production costs are much lower. So that's Deng's uh, kind of grand idea about how to use the Chinese factory system or build it up and use it. And he says at some point, uh, who knows when, when uh, the Chinese government and the Chinese owned companies have made enough money, they have enough cash on hand to start transitioning toward higher level technology, then the factories will kind of be repurposed and remade to build the higher level tech stuff so that China can kind of launch its factory system up to be on par, competitive with uh, other factory systems uh, almost anywhere else in the world. So that's a big piece of Deng's uh, kind of overall theory. Uh, let's see, but so th the big result is that in the 1980s there's a massive amount of economic growth in China. Uh, this st stuff is hugely successful. Uh, ch the Chinese economy starts growing by massive amounts. Um, 10, 12, 14, 16 percent a year uh, in what we call GDP, gross domestic product which is uh, a gigantic level. Uh, the United States government says that uh, U.S. economic growth rates, they say 3% is pretty decent. And that 3%, uh, 4% is really good, 5% is real good. They say that 6% and up means that the economy is growing too fast, that that could lead to major problems like uh, monetary inflation, which means the there's so much more money being exchanged throughout society because the economy is growing so fast that the value of individual dollars starts to go down. And that means that the prices of goods start to grow, go up faster than wages grow up. So that's what we call problem of inflation. And the U.S. government is always worried about inflation. So the U.S. government often says that you don't really want to get to 6, 7, 8 percent economic growth per year in the country because that brings up all kinds of other types of problems. And uh, the Chinese economy is growing by at least 10% per year throughout the 1980s and 90s. So it's massive economic growth uh, that to a lot of Westerners looks kind of out of control. And it did bring a lot of problems to China in the 1980s. They do get an inflation problem. The value of their money does go down. Prices of goods go up. And, of course, their wages don't go up to, to keep pace with inflation. So they're working hard in their factories, you know, 40, 50, maybe 70 hours a week. Um, but they're not making enough money to pay for rent and to buy food. Uh, there's another major problem that emerges, which is mass migration. Uh, all the economic growth, the major economic growth, is happening in the eastern cities along the Chinese coastline, along the Pacific Ocean, because that's where companies want to build factories, because that's where they can pull their boats up to the factories and warehouses, load up with stuff, and then uh, ship that stuff out to the rest of the world. So the mass amount of factories are being built in the, along the eastern coastline and that means that you have a mass migration of farm workers uh, agricultural workers that are leaving central and western china and pouring into these eastern cities that are growing like crazy because that's where the factory jobs are that's where the opportunity is to make more money than you would on a farm uh, and of course the exciting life of living in a city and whatnot 
Um, and that's where all the big colleges and universities start to grow. So you start to see a mass migration of people from West to East China. And that becomes a kind of systematic problem for um, uh, just the overgrowth of cities and having enough resources and food and water supply and whatnot uh, for this mass migration of people. And it also means that you have less and less farmers. Um, even while your population is growing, China will not grow uh, enough food by the late 1980s in their massive farmlands to feed their own population. So eventually they're going to have to start importing food from foreign countries. Um, and another big problem is just corruption in the government. Uh, because these foreign companies that want to build factories to make mass profit, uh, they have to get government permits and plans to build those factories and a lot of government bureaucrats even on the local level take a lot of bribes so there's a lot of corruption going on and it even becomes fairly obvious by the late 1980s uh, you know it's some government bureaucrat that's in charge of uh, I don't know uh, determining land easements or something that shouldn't be making just much more than a you know little government salary uh, their kids start driving around in Ferraris and stuff like that so it's pretty obvious that they're taking bribes by the late 80s um, and another problem emerges for China in the 1980s, uh, you know, the Chinese government is still a hardcore dictatorship, does not want political debate amongst the population, uh, watches their population very closely uh, for any kind of dissent or argument or possible kind of revolutionary sentiment. So there's a lot of control over Chinese media uh, and the population. And, uh, you know, Communist governments like to keep control over their economy, so they like to be able to shut down factories for uh, not much reason given without a formal lawsuit or court order or anything. So the Chinese government still want to retain that amount of control over their society. And uh, one of the big problems with that is a lot of foreign investors don't like that kind of control. Um, they don't like the idea if I invest $100 million in a factory in Shanghai that uh, the government might decide once it's going and I'm making money uh, to... Uh, you know, force me to pay a bribe to a local government leader to keep it running or maybe just have it shut down one day and now I've lost my investment. So a lot of uh, private companies uh, want more openness and more kind of clear uh, legal formats, uh, clear laws for building factories and running things and labor laws and all that that they should follow and that the government should um, only you know, go after people for breaking the law objectively rather than just trying to you know shake down a company or just deciding that they don't like a certain company anymore just shutting them down so there's this kind of push and pull this kind of um, stress on the Chinese system uh, and there's kind of an open question once the growth is really kicking into high gear in the 80s um, how much is the Chinese government going to continue trying to control their economy and their society to that degree or are they going to allow a certain amount of openness and a legal framework to develop to guarantee kind of stability for the long term for these companies that are coming in. Uh, so that's a, a constant kind of strain and a constant question about China. Are they going to allow the openness that a lot of companies demand to make the investment or is the government going to try to continue with this uh, kind of controlling uh, uh, kind of method of operating for the long term? Uh, so there's a lot of these problems going on in the 1980s in China, and it's become pretty obvious to the Chinese population. So uh, by the late 1980s, you get this event uh, that starts off as really a funeral for a high-ranking Chinese Communist Party member and uh, a guy who had spoken out against corruption and whatnot and, and said we have these big problems we have to solve. Uh, his name was Hu Yobang. Uh, he died in 1989 and because he was such a high up leader the government decided to hold a state funeral for him to celebrate his life and whatnot so um, they opened up Tiananmen Square uh, for the people to come you know view the body and and have public mourning and whatnot uh, a lot of governments do this for their kind of big political heroes or leaders um, and a lot of people start showing up in mass numbers to Tiananmen Square uh, to take part in this kind of public funeral process. And the problem for the Chinese government is that a lot of people, 
start talking to each other at this Tiananmen Square event. And Tiananmen Square is absolutely massive. It's a huge kind of open space surrounded by buildings, government buildings. Um, and a lot of people start talking to each other in the square about how great this politician was and really what should we do now with his ideas. So a lot of people refuse to leave the square after their day at the event and uh, they start to occupy the square and they start to make uh, demands. So there's a kind of encampment that starts off and starts to grow in massive amounts. And uh, this is largely led by college-age students and largely younger people in the spring of 1989 that are demanding an end to this government tyranny. Uh, they want more uh, political representation, maybe democracy where they get to vote to choose their leaders. So there's all these kinds of demands that these people are making. And it grows from a few thousand into hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people probably in the square and they're refusing to leave. And um, they're demanding major reforms that the Chinese government doesn't really want to give up their control to, to implement. And we have to remember that this is going on in 1989, uh, the same moment that a lot of similar kind of uprisings and complaints and occupations are going on in Eastern Europe and even in Russia, uh, the Soviet Union, that in 1989 took down the Soviet Empire and destroyed communism in Eastern Europe and eventually destroyed the Soviet Union itself a, a couple years later. So this is happening in China also. So this is a very kind of optimistic, heady moment where people are getting together and saying just the power of people occupying and making demands can change a government, can change the way people live and can overthrow governments. Uh, the downside is that Deng Xiaoping and his leaders uh, kept telling people that they should, you know, end these complaints and go home and, you know, the government will think about it and that kind of stuff. Um, but the people never do. So in late May 1989, um, Deng declared martial law, which means curfews and uh, close government surveillance over Tiananmen Square, and again told the people to leave, um, to disperse, and the people didn't. So on the night of June 3rd, going into the morning of June 4th, uh, Dung and the military order soldiers to go into the square with machine guns and just start shooting people. And they do. The soldiers follow orders and they go in and they just start machine gunning people uh, almost ran randomly, uh, just firing into the crowds. And of course the crowds panic and they run away. Um, but we estimate that several thousand people are killed in this. And there's some uh, very popular famous images that have emerged um, in the following days of uh, the government occupation of their own cities and intimidation of their own people. So they uh, basically told people that you need to stay in your houses and you cannot come out even in the daytime. And people are so afraid of the Chinese government uh, because they just show that they're willing to kill thousands of people um, just to stay in control and to end these complaints. Um, uh, one of the most famous images is here of Chinese tanks, military tanks, rolling right down the, one of the major boulevards in, I believe this is Beijing. And uh, there's this one guy that appeared to have a couple shopping bags who was kind of out on the side, on the sidewalk by the street, and was walking along doing whatever he was doing. And when he saw the tanks come out, and they were rolling down the middle of the street, uh, apparently he just kind of lost it and got pissed off and walked out into the middle of the street and uh, dared them to run him over to follow orders. And uh, this is just happened to be filmed by a Western camera crew that was in their hotel uh, up above the street, overlooking the street, and they happened to have some cameras, and they you know, saw this starting to happen, and they started to film it. So this might be one of who knows how many other instances of a kind of popular outrage at the government trying to take a stand and this is the only one that we have uh, video footage of because that was the one that had a camera crew that saw it that filmed it um, that hid their film and got it out of the country and showed it to the rest of the world so uh, what happens with this guy is he goes out there and he stands in in the middle of the street and uh, just stands there and basically dares the tanks to run him over and uh, the tanks get real close which is the still image that you see here and uh, the lead tank stopped right in front of the guy, and the rest of the tanks behind stopped. And the lead tank kind of backed up 
and uh, went to the side and tried to drive around them, and the guy gets in front of the tank again. He moves over to the side to block its path. And this goes on for a little while, about a minute or so. The tank backs up and tries to go around, and the guy gets in front of the tank, and this kind of goes back and forth for a little bit. And uh, eventually, the, the top of the tank pops up, and a soldier pops out. And you can see that he's kind of screaming at the guy to get out of the way and waving his hand, telling him to move. And uh, the guy gets so angry, he climbs up on the top of the tank, and you see him yelling things down. The soldier kind of popped back down into the tank, and you can see the guy climbs up on top of the tank and starts yelling down into the hole. And um, this goes on for a little while, too. He's just screaming at him. And eventually he climbs down off the tank, and he's in the street again, and a few people, whoever they are, uh, come and grab him, and uh, just seem to be civilians, and they just kind of pull him out to the side and get him the hell out of there so he didn't get run over, um, and hopefully he can get away with it. Uh, to this day, we do not know who this guy was. We don't know his name, and we don't know what happened to him. No one's ever come forward to say that that was me, and uh, this is why I did it, or you know, tell their story. Uh, so we still have no idea who he was. Uh, we don't know if he got away with it, if he escaped the country, if he went to farming areas or something like that, changed his identity, who knows. Or maybe the government caught him and executed him or put him in jail forever. I mean, we have no idea, even to this moment, what happened to this guy. So this get, these images get broadcast throughout the world and it becomes a kind of great symbol of the the, the anger that the Chinese people had and their willingness to stand up to the government, but in the end the government was too powerful and too ruthless and too cutthroat and they're just willing to mow down thousands of their own people uh, to stay in control. So the government told the world that they killed maybe two or three hundred people and all this, um, but historians and even kind of uh, researchers at the time estimated it's probably at least in the thousands. Uh, and this is so humiliating to the government that Deng Xiaoping retires pretty soon after that. He was getting to be old. He was around since the 50s or so in politics. Uh, so he's getting to be old. So he retires in 1989, and a new government will come into office to replace him. But again, it takes a few years for that government to, uh, you know, consolidate power and to get their majority uh, among the highest level government leaders uh, to, you know, build their coalition and get appointed into office. All right, so next leader, uh, after Deng Xiaoping retired, the next guy who emerges by the uh, next few years or so, by 92, is named Zheng Zemin. He was the former mayor of Shanghai. So he was politically known as a kind of a, a good economic leader for the city and uh, he had good economic ideas that were successful for the city. So he was able to kind of use that success and kind of rise up to the next level of Chinese politics. So by 1992, he is firmly in charge and uh, he takes um, uh, power in the three major kind of pillars of the Chinese government. He takes the leadership of the state, the kind of official state bureaucracy, he is the head of the Chinese Communist Party, and he also proclaims himself to be head of the military, and he uh, gets permission to do that by the you know, few hundred or so highest level leaders. Uh, so he controls the three major kind of political systems in China all at the same time. And his idea is to continue pushing what he calls for the market-oriented economy. And what does that mean? How does it work? It's basically the same that Deng Xiaoping uh, had advocated. Um, continue bringing in foreign companies, uh, foreign direct investment, build the factories. Um, the government will tax those companies and build up uh, tax revenue on a massive scale. And um, he's going to basically keep going with the same type of system. So, um, he wants to continue these market-oriented reforms. Um, there's a few problems that go with that, even with the massive economic growth that they're still going to experience in the 1990s under Zemin's leadership. Um, one major problem is that, uh, you know, the Ch they still claim to be communists. And they, in order to still keep that claim of being communist, uh, they, the government still ran basically government-owned companies. 
with government bureaucrats as the kind of CEOs and, and managers of those companies. So uh, the Chinese called those state-owned enterprises, and they've been around for a while. Uh, they've been around even in you know, 1979 when Deng was implementing all these market-based reforms. Uh, and they're kept around as kind of an ideological thing. They, they don't cost a whole lot of money. Um, but by the 1990s, uh, the state-owned enterprises are falling further and further behind uh, the efficiency standards of the foreign and uh, privately owned companies, the profit motive companies, um, to the point that these state-owned enterprises are kind of backward, uh, they're not efficient, and they actually lose money. You know, they make stuff and they sell stuff, but they spend more money on salaries and decisions and whatnot um, than they make. So if these were private companies, they'd go bankrupt. But they don't go bankrupt because uh, the government funds them through tax revenue. So these companies, these state-owned enterprises, are not just dependent on selling enough product at profit to sustain their business they are sustained through government investment on a yearly basis. The government gives them a budget allocation to keep them going. So this becomes a kind of train, a drain on the Chinese government budget uh, year to, on a year-to-year -year basis. Uh, so they become questionable like, how much should the government put up with this and keep them around just in order to say that there's still some amount of communism kind of going on in the, in the market economy. So the disproportional growth is still a major problem. And again, this is because the, the factory builders want to make their factories along the coastline because they can pull up their boats uh, right up to the, the factory itself or the warehouse and load up on goods and then sail out into the rest of the world and sell those goods for profit. Uh, the only time that you get a giant population center in an internal part of the country is uh, some city that's located next to a river that's wide and deep enough uh, to get the boats up the river um, to access the factories or the warehouses and then they load up and sail down the river get to the Pacific Ocean and then on to wherever their destination is so again uh, the population is growing massively in the east because people are leaving the west and the central parts of the country and they're going to where the factories are where the jobs are where the colleges and universities are uh, where the cities are uh, so China still undergoes that problem for the entire decade in the 1990s um, and trying to figure out how do you keep how do you convince people to stay on the farms to keep the farms productive enough to at least feed some part of the population. Uh, you also have another several kind of big problems in the 1990s that are similar to the 1980s. Uh, a lot of the uh, economic growth is based on debt. Um, companies, even Chinese-owned companies, privately-owned companies that are borrowing money uh, to build factories to invest. So there's a whole lot of uh, corporate and personal debt in China in the 1990s. Uh, there's agricultural failures because, again, a lot of people are moving out of the farming zones and going toward the cities. And there's continuing political corruption because government bureaucrats are in control of permitting and building and regulating uh, these companies as, as much as they are regulated and uh, those local government officials take bribes on a massive scale. So this uh, continuing political corruption is still a, a giant problem in the 90s. Uh, but overall, uh, Zhang's uh, policies are very successful. Um, they continue getting their giant economic growth rates, uh, 10, 12, 14, 15, 18 percent some years. Uh, it's really pretty unbelievable. It, uh, today we call it the most successful economic growth policy in all of human history. So those growth rates continue on a massive scale. Um, one other problem though for the Chinese Communist Party is that these kind of market reforms and uh, all this economic growth is completely reliant on increasing levels of capitalism. Um, Profit-based companies going in and building factories and making money and um, that's where the growth comes from. The state-owned enterprises aren't doing it. Communism is not doing it. So this kind of creates a big question. Um, how communist is communist China anymore? Uh, what, what does the government really own anymore? What, what kind of systems do they run? Because they don't seem to be running the factory system. 
which is the massive sources sources of economic growth, or at least the state-owned enterprises where they exist are not doing it very well. Um, so how dedicated to communism is the Chinese Communist Party? So the, the party seems to be caught in this bind where uh, the population does not like being politically repressed. Um, the population does not like this dictatorship. They only tolerate the party because the party guarantees uh, massive economic growth. Um, basically, the they figure that the population supports the party because the economics of the country are doing so well. People feel that there's a lot of opportunities out there for them individually, um, for them to you know go work or you know go to school or something, and that they can build wealth for themselves personally. And when people feel that though there's there's those opportunities out there in society, um, you know they they're willing to tolerate some uh, bad government. They're willing to tolerate some corruption and some oppression politically. If as long as it looks like the government is doing well for the economy. So the Chinese Communist Party is kind of in this bind where they know that the population doesn't like the dictatorship but they tolerate it because there's this economic growth going. But while they have economic growth going at this massive scale, that's relying on capitalism, which means they're not really so much communist anymore except in name. And this becomes a big joke about China. How communist is China? And how communist will they be in the future? Are they kind of renouncing communism in order to get the profit and the economic growth going to... Uh, you know, calm the population down to stop them from revolting against the government. So all these things are bound together in the Chinese experience, and the government watches these things on a very close kind of level um, and is very worried about this stuff for the long term. And uh, well, here's a good map of what foreign direct investment looks like in China. Uh, you can see in the kind of white areas where the economic growth is above 15 percent a year uh, by the late 1990s there's massive growth and it's almost all along the coastline uh, there is some more growth in a couple of uh, the internal areas the kind of lighter gray areas there's a little bit better um, and it's entirely because again these these foreign companies these capitalist companies they want to be able to pull their boats right up to the coastline and uh, access the factories and the warehouses and load up on goods and then leave um, as fast as possible and go to where they're going. Uh, so they build the factories along the coastline. Uh, the big city internally in the uh, kind of middle of the country is Chongqing, uh, which is basically on this giant river system that the boats can access to, to get all the way up into there in the first place. And you see that the, by far the lowest growth rates are uh, out in the western areas or the northern areas that are away from the big cities, away from the coastline. So they have the lowest growth rates uh, throughout the 90s. If you look closely at the kind of northeastern corner where Beijing is, they're talking about 26% economic growth per year. I mean, this is unbelievable. So um, we see the population shift from the west and the middle toward the east increasingly. And um, the, the party will have to try to figure out how they're going to solve that problem. And um, so uh, Jiang Zemin's leadership and his government, they're largely continuing the, the market-based reforms from the 1980s. They're scaling them up. They're kind of tinkering with the system a little bit, but no major changes. Uh, the biggest change that Zeng, Zheng's leadership is going to implement is called uh, the transition, basically, from the light industry, the light manufacturing, the plastic junk. Uh, they're going to start their transition toward more high-technology stuff by the mid to late 1990s. So um, they're going to get into producing goods, products that they think are going to be the basis of the future economy. So, uh, and they've made that transition very well going up to today. Uh, um, they've continued that transition. So uh, today, um, Chinese companies are the biggest and most efficient manufacturer of solar panels, of uh, components for windmills because they think that renewable energy is going to be the future and everything's going to be electrified instead of uh, uh, relying on um, gasoline or coal. Uh, 
or oil. So they're invested massively in uh, building the products that will create the, the 21st century um, green economy. They've also invested very, very heavily in robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, um, and kind of factory automation robots in factories that are making things instead of uh, people putting parts together and whatnot. So they are transitioning into the highest levels of technology today, and that transition started under Zheng's leadership in the 1990s. Another big change that uh, Zheng made in uh, the early 1990s was that uh, they created this rule and added it to the Chinese Constitution that said that the leadership is has a term limit of 10 years so they put together this rule in 1992 and it said that uh, the, the party leaders and the highest level kind of government officials they have really a 10-year term of office so they go in uh, officially in kind of 1992 when this change is made and they have 10 years from that point to you know put their program through and run things and at the end of 10 years they are forced into retirement they are termed out their term is over so in 2002 you're going to get a transition to a younger generation that are in usually like their 40s or 50s or something like that and so uh, Zhang's leadership will go out of office into their official retirement and um, the next leadership will come in in 2002. Uh, the, the Chinese also have another big decision to make as a transition in the late 1990s about whether or not to join the World Trade Organization known as the WTO. Um, there's kind of big arguments for and against that for China. The big argument for it is that all these foreign companies are doing business in China. They want China to be a member of the WTO because the WTO sends like international legal rules for trade, buying and selling, importing, exporting. What happens if you, uh, one company sues another or a company wants to sue a government or something like that? So this is a worldwide organization as you can see here from the map. Um, most of the major economies in the world are involved with as uh, full-scale members and uh, China wanted to be uh, some Chinese leaders wanted to join the WTO in order to uh, stabilize the legal regime over the factory system and whatnot and attract more foreign investment into China to keep the economy booming uh, the arguments against China joining the WTO is that it would have to follow international rules. The party can, just can't do whatever it wants with individual factories anymore. Uh, there's a, this kind of international uh, law system under the WTO that they would have to follow or face um, getting kicked out or face uh, massive lawsuits against them or something like that. Um, and eventually the Chinese government decided that uh, the benefits of joining the WTO were much greater than the cost of not joining so they eventually decide to join and I think they become a member in the year 2000. So uh, Zhang and his leadership go out of office in 2002. They go into retirement. A new leadership is chosen um, and this splits power uh, does the opposite of what Zhang did when he took over those three offices. It uh, appoints three different people to, to run those three different offices. Uh, so there's a different guy uh, between Hu Xiantou and Wei, Wen Shibo. Um, one of them will run the Chinese Communist Party. One of them will run the official state bureaucracy. And they have another guy run the military. Um, so they kind of go back to kind of normal. And they're going to have their 10-year term of office with their high leaders in all the highest level positions. And they're largely going to continue uh, the major market reforms. And they're going to continue China on the same trajectory it's been on, which is massive economic growth uh, driven by the growth of capitalism in the country. Um, so the leadership is split for 10 years. There's no one person in charge of the place. And that will really continue uh, until 2012 when their terms are up and they go out of office. And the new leadership comes in in 2012 led by a guy named Xi Jinping. And uh, he and his leaders go into office uh, in 2012 and they largely continue the same trajectory and major, no major economic changes there. Uh, the big changes that uh, she and his leaders will make is to eventually debate getting rid of those term limits. So this became big news uh, 
in late 2017, early 2018, when uh, word got out that uh, the Chinese Communist Party was considering changing its constitution to eliminate that 10-year term limit. And they eventually passed that and became a, an amendment to the constitution in March 2018. So now there is no limit on how long she or his leaders might remain in office. So uh, it's looking increasingly that she is consolidating power and he's looking to stay in office possibly for the rest of his life as a uh, Chinese leader. And he's justifying this according to the economic growth. And he's saying that I have to stay in office for a long time because I'm going after all these corrupt internal officials. And, uh, you know, if I just have a tenure of office, uh, basically they'll calm down their corruption and they'll just wait for me to leave office in 10 years. Um, and then once I leave office, they'll go back to the corruption. So he, his argument, it's a good thing for him to stick around for as long as possible because then he'll have more time to kind of... Um, detect and find and uh, punish, get rid of those corrupt political leaders. Um, so he's gone after some political leaders for corruption. Uh, interestingly, he's gone after the other faction, the people that internally seem to be kind of questioning his leadership. So he's going after mostly, it appears, his internal enemies and consolidating power for the long term. Um, let's see, what other China changes do we have in China since the early 2000s? Um, China has been using its... Uh, market power, we believe, according to reports, um, to, uh, to continue its, its economic dominance and to launch into especially its high-tech kind of revolution, its high-tech transition. So it's using its market power in three different major ways. And uh, the first way is through what has become known as the China model. And that means that um, the Chinese government is taking tax revenue. Um, the Chinese government has this huge budget surplus every single year, so they're making money off of taxes. They're not just getting tax revenue and spending it all on a yearly basis. They're stockpiling the money year after year. So they have these massive amounts of money laying in accounts ready to spend. And they're spending some of that on... Uh, incentives and direct investments into what they think are the most important or the most efficient or the best Chinese companies that are uh, launching into this high-tech revolution. So the Chinese government is giving direct government subsidies in money to what they think are the best companies that are at the forefront of technological development to push them to develop more, uh, hoping that those companies are going to kind of overtake uh, technological innovation and become the leaders of innovation in the world overtake Silicon Valley or wherever else you might talk about in the world um, and make China into the technological leader uh, of the 21st century so they're doing that through state subsidies government subsidies uh, mostly in money sometimes in land and other kind of little permissive deals that they give to their own internal companies um, Another way that they're doing this is through what's called forced technology transfer. And this basically means that um, the Chinese government is demanding that any of these high-tech companies that want to sell their products in the Chinese market, which is one of the biggest markets in the world, has well over a billion people, has something like five or six times the amount of people than the United States. So it's a massive market of potential customers that uh, companies from all over the world want to get into to sell their products because that's where there's going to be a, a lot of customers to make money off of. Um, the Chinese government is demanding, or has been since the early mid-2000s, that foreign companies that want to come in and sell their products in China's market to the Chinese population have to build a factory to make those products in China so that they employ Chinese workers and whatnot and that they have to build that factory in partnership with Chinese companies Chinese owns invested companies and that in doing so these uh, often American companies are very angry at this because they say if we build our factory in China 
and we are forced to take on a Chinese company as a partner in that factory, then that company is going to get access to all of our um, production secrets, our innovation secrets, our patents, um, and they're basically going to learn our corporate secrets to the point where they're going to know how to produce this stuff, whatever it is that this company makes or designs. They're going to learn all those secrets and who knows, maybe that Chinese company will just go off and build another factory all by itself somewhere and mass produce stolen secrets basically. So that's why it's called forced technology transfer. Um, these foreign companies are complaining that they are forced to turn over their technological secrets to Chinese companies in partnership to build the factory in the first place. And uh, U.S. companies are very angry about that, especially uh, they complain to the U.S. government because that kind of stuff, that forced technology, that forced kind of partnership is a violation of the WTO rules. And so um, a lot of these foreign companies go to their own governments back home and say, look, the Chinese government is forcing us to do this. They won't give us open access that we're supposed to have under the WTO to access the, the market without these demands. And the U.S. government or some other government says to their own you know, private companies in their own country, well, what do you want us to do about it? Should we bring lawsuits in the WTO against China? And these companies say, no, no, don't do that. Because if the Chinese government learns that we have told you this and you bring a lawsuit and you cause all these kind of international um, complaints, basically, that they'll lock our company out of the Chinese market in the first place. So we'll never get access. So the companies, uh, the foreign companies have these complaints, but they don't want to do anything about these complaints because they still want to sell these products in China. So the Chinese government has figured out a kind of master strategy for using the size of their economy and the size of their giant customer base, their population, to intimidate foreign companies um, to get what they want, to basically get away with breaking the international trade rules. So it is no secret that companies know that this is going on, but they're unwilling to take the enforcement step because they're going to be punished um, by the Chinese government just restricting their access to the market to the point that the companies don't even want to take that step, so they just put up with being forced to partner with Chinese companies. And we don't really know where that leads as of now. That could help these Chinese companies uh, develop the highest levels of technology possible and they could use that to launch uh, their own technological revolution and uh, you know we're waiting to see what the results of that's going to be this could make China into the most uh, technologically innovative country in the world in the next few decades in the next decade or maybe even two so it's going to be interesting and a lot of people are kind of scared about this when they think about it um, that this dictatorship is going to have control over the highest levels of technology in the world. Uh, it can be pretty intimidating. And the last thing that the Chinese government does is they also take this huge amount of government money that they're sitting on this yearly kind of tax revenue surplus. And uh, there's these reports that the Chinese government is sending some of its bureaucrats or even hiring Chinese investors um, to go to Western countries, to go to Silicon Valley or wherever else the innovation uh, places in other countries and offer to simply just take money and invest in foreign companies to buy a stake in that company possibly to get access to that company's um, you know technology secrets and their innovations and their patents and their trademarks and whatnot um, or maybe just to outright buy those companies um, so the Chinese government seems to be, according to reports, targeting very specific companies in the United States, Canada, uh, Japan, wherever else, uh, to make those investment stakes or possibly just buy a majority of the shares in those companies. And we're talking about billions and billions and billions of dollars. Uh, so if um, the China model of direct subsidies, subsidies to their own companies and the forced technology transfer doesn't work, they might just try to outright buy the technological innovation that they're looking to get just for cash. So that also is very intimidating to a lot of uh, kind of thinkers around the world about what the future holds for all of this stuff.
And uh, China isn't stopping there just with their own kind of internal uh, technological development. They're also looking externally to build the sources of worldwide power. Uh, one of them is to start building international economic alliances with their neighbors and the places that they think are going to be the sources of major economic growth for the rest of the 21st century, if not longer. So they have targeted India because it's massive population. Um, it is industrializing. Um, Bangladesh is right next door. Uh, Southeast Asia has some of the biggest economic growth rates in the world today. And they've also um, tried to make deals with South Korea and Japan, some of the most technologically adept countries in the world, some of the most advanced technology countries in the world. And because they're kind of looking to build this now into a southern and eastern Asian kind of economic cooperation zone, um, possibly a political alliance, they've also looked to bring in the vast island system of Southeast Asia and all the way down to Australia and New Zealand to bring them into a kind of cooperative uh, free trade zone basically uh, possibly to make it into a political international alliance that might eventually be a military international alliance um, and if they are the source of world economic growth um, this could be the most powerful alliance in the future, in the 21st, maybe 22nd centuries. So uh, they're looking to build the kind of framework for international power, and obviously China is hoping to lead this kind of system, um, just like the United States leads NATO or something like that, um, as the, the center of world power going into the future. And the United States specifically has been very worried about this, um, you know, reports started emerging around 2010, 2012 that this that Chinese government was trying to get this off the ground. And right around that time, the United States was also trying to build its own kind of cooperative economic zone of southeastern places and combine it with North America and the kind of Pacific facing um, economic allies that the United States has along the kind of Pacific coastline. So the United States started calling this the Trans-Pacific Partnership or TPP. And these negotiations uh, became public around 2008-2009. And uh, this is something that the Obama administration was very interested and very dedicated to, trying to build up um, uh, a membership, really, of the same types of areas uh, that the Chinese are going after. So the U.S. and Chinese had been uh, competing with each other, trying to get uh, allies in the same region uh, for the same reason. So uh, the United States was pursuing that until President Trump came into office in 2017. And of course, Trump is a big uh, kind of anti-free trade um, type of politician. And the TPP was really based on free trade. Uh, so Trump didn't like it. So he um, basically um, torpedoed it. He sank it uh, right when he came into office. He said, that's off the table. We're not doing that anymore. Uh, another way that China is building up what we tend to call soft power uh, international friendships is by building up um, investments in foreign countries, uh, giving foreign countries money to build their infrastructure, their schools or hospitals or electricity grids or whatever they want to do. Um, the, its biggest thing for doing that, its biggest method is to build up um, transportation infrastructure in different countries and trying to link that infrastructure together under what they call the Belt and Road Initiative. So this is a map that shows um, in red, the road system they want to build, which would be like massive interstate highways, really, intercountry highways, that would travel along a lot of old portions of the old kind of ancient Silk Road uh, through the uh, kind of northern India and through um, kind of Persia and getting toward, um, uh, you know, the doorstep of Europe, Germany, which is the kind of industrial hub of Europe these days. Uh, and they also want to build a big train line from Beijing in the east, this kind of grayish line that would connect up to the Trans-Siberian Railroad and go all the way through Moscow and again get into Eastern Europe and into Germany. Uh, so they're building this in order to try to link the European economy and orient it more toward facing eastward toward China and uh, build up their market access to the European market. Uh, Europe has twice as many people in it right now as the United States does. So this could be their attempt to ax the major European markets um, to sell the grids that are going to be made in Chinese factories for 
who knows how many decades. So uh, this is another, they think of it as a, they present it as a kind of win-win scenario for these foreign countries. Uh, these countries are getting free road networks and free transportation networks, basically, um, in exchange for linking up with the Chinese economy. So that might be pulling more countries economically into the Chinese zone or the Chinese orbit going into the future. Another big thing that China has been doing has been investing in Africa on a massive scale uh, through infrastructure projects, um, but also through uh, land acquisitions um, and buying up uh, companies that produce things that uh, the Chinese market needs, largely oil to run its factories, to run its economy, make it to gasoline and whatnot, and diesel fuel, and also um, food. Uh, Africa is probably one of the biggest uh, untapped natural resource bases on the planet now. And so China is uh, buying up land and uh, you know, making donations to build roads and schools and hospitals and whatnot in some of these African countries to build up good relations with those countries, uh, to get trade deals with those countries, to uh, buy the natural resources out of those areas and um, bring them into China for use. So China is thinking very, very long term about their own resource shortages, uh, the expansion of their own markets, and eventually probably to sell their goods into Africa. And they tell African leaders, look, we'll bring you into the Industrial Revolution just like we're doing here. So China is looking at uh, kind of building up their... Um, they're building blocks of uh, what some people are calling a possible worldwide empire and trying to uh, compete with the United States for world power. Um, and they seem to be doing it extremely efficiently, uh, very intelligently, and thinking about the far future, you know, three, four, five decades from now, about what they want the world to be like under their own leadership. And, uh, you know, how do they build up a worldwide system to get them there? Uh, so that's what uh, a lot of observers in the United States are looking at and saying, wow, they're really doing this stuff, and this is something the United States should really deeply be worried about. Um, unfortunately, the United States government tends to think much more shorter term, maybe in the next two to five, maybe ten years. Um, but uh, U.S. leaders are elected democratically, so they often um, either running for election they don't think about the long-term future or they don't talk about what they're thinking about um, they all their election strategies seem to be in the next two to five years in order to to win their next election and stay in office uh, so a lot of international observers are thinking that uh, China could really launch itself to the heights of world power and uh, compete very heavily with the United States in the next few decades and um, you know we'll see what those decades bring and what the result of all this is and we'll stop there for today.